Hey everyone, it's me, Phil, from The Week in Doubt. Why am I laughing? Uh, definitely a very stressful week at work. And uh, I got this is Friday night. I got home, popped a Yo Him Bean, and uh, that's how weird a Yo Him Bean almost sounded like a Senzu Bean. But you know, Yo Him Bean, Yo Him Be, uh, kind of this herbal weight loss drug kind of central nervous system stimulant that I tend to take. Uh, <laughs> I popped one of those and uh, two Kratom and then took a nap. I'm like, maybe I'll wake up in a better mood, which I did, which I did. Um, I might actually try to squeeze out a few small episodes this week. And I, I guess this will be the uh, the first one. And uh, my friend Crocoduck sent me a link to this article via Twitter, and it's from Scientific American, and uh, it's entitled, Atheism is Inconsistent with the Scientific Method, Prize-Winning Physicist Says, and this is, appropriately enough, in the uh, physics section. And the subheading is, in conversation, the 2019 Templeton Prize winner does not pull pen does not pull punches on the limits of science, the value of humility, and the irrationality of non-belief. And this article is dated March 20th. And so right off the bat, kind of a provocative title there, uh, Atheism is Inconsistent with the Scientific Method. And it kind of pulls you in because it's, it's not an evangelical Christian or young earth creationist saying this, it's a prize-winning physicist. Yeah, because usually, you know, when we think of the whole atheist versus theist thing, um, we tend to think of atheists uh, as the ones being rooted firmly in the scientific camp. You know, sometimes you will have someone on the theist side who happens to be uh, a respected scientist, even in, you know, in mainstream circles, such as Francis Collins a believing Christian who is also the head of the uh, Human Genome Project. Uh, but often we think of people on the theist side, especially the young creationist types, as embracing a kind of uh, a pseudoscience, a kind of version of science that's uh, kind of corrupted and deformed uh, by, their, uh, by their young earth creationist views and their need to make science conform to their religious, uh, their religious worldview. And we think of the, the atheist being in the more, you know, kind of solid mainstream scientific camp. So when you see a headline like atheism is, is inconsistent with the scientific method, and this is a prize winning physicist saying it, hmm, yeah, it's going to grab your attention, you know? So here's a picture of the gentleman in question, theoretical physicist. Is it Marcello or Marcello Gleiser or Glazer, recipient of the 2019 Templeton Prize? Okay. And his name is peppered all throughout this article, so this should give me ample opportunity to repeatedly butcher his name. So I'll, I'll go with Marcello Gla Glazer. <laughs> I don't know. A 60-year-old Brazil-born theoretical physicist at, Darth, at Dartmouth College and prolific science popularizer has won this year's Templeton Prize, valued at just under $1.5 million. Not bad, man. The award from the John Templeton Foundation annually recognizes an individual who has made an exceptional contribution to affirming life's spiritual dimension. Its past recipients include scientific luminaries such as Sir Martin Rees and Freeman Dyson, as well as religious or political leaders such as Mother Teresa. That's a whole other can of worms. I, I should do a short little documentary on Mother Teresa someday. Uh, Desmond Tutu and the Dalai Lama. Across his 35-year scientific career, Gleiser or Glazer's uh, research has covered a wide breadth of topics, ranging from the properties of the early universe to the behavior of fundamental particles and the origins of life. 
But in awarding him its most prestigious honor, the Templeton Foundation chiefly cited his status as a leading public intellectual revealing the historical, philosophical, and cultural links between the science, between, oh, between the science, between science, the humanities, and spirituality. He is also the first Latin American to receive the prize. Scientific American spoke with Glazer or Gleiser about the award, how he plans to advance his message of consilience, the need for humility in science, why humans are special. Uh, that's kind of right on the, the tail of uh, humility in science, why humans are special, and the fundamental source of his curi curiosity as a physicist. And as an animal lover, I always think there is something that sounds a little arrogant when people say things like, you know, humans are special. But at the same time, I mean, tr you know, trying to remain completely intellectually honest, we are special in a way. Different animals excel in different ways, in different areas. And we, with our big brains, our opposable thumbs, etc., um, our capacity for language and keen self-awareness, uh, etc. We are really special in that sense, and we have uh, a achieved remarkable things. Um, so, you know, I was kind of kidding around there, um, joking about what I half saw as a kind of uh, a hint of hypocrisy, you know, right after talking about humility, going into, uh, you know, how humans are special. And saying humans are special, that's uh, that's kind of loaded, too, because you can almost feel that's opening the door for... Uh, you, you, can, you can feel it coming, that um, religious types are going to say the reason why we're special is because God done did it. God made us special. Uh, God gave us uh, faculties that he didn't give other, quote-unquote, lower animals. Um so I guess as uh, as contradictory as it might sound, you know, I, I'm uh, I try to I, I'm always a little wary when people start using language like that, but at the same time, yeah, end of the day, I do think we're we're special. <laughs> we, we we are vastly different than any other animal on the planet, um, for better and worse. We've accomplished so much, and we're capable of so much. Art, literature, architecture, science, you know, um, all of that. But at the same time, um, we've also proven ourselves capable of poisoning the planet and wiping out other species, you know what I mean? So those big brains of ours, you know, there's an upside and a downside, I think. Okay, so it says, uh, an edited transcript of the interview follows. Scientific American, first, blah, 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 blah. and... Uh, <laughs> My goal this uh, week, or rather this weekend, is to try to get a few... Di There's so many topics. I, I, I've said this before on the show, that despite how long I've been doing this, it's well over 300 episodes now, you know, you would think I might be running out of topics. It, it's the opposite. There's always new show ideas popping into my head, and it, it's hard to keep up with them all and kind of check them off the list. And there's a few that I've really been kind of champing at the bit. Champing or chomping? Champing at the bit to, to do. And I actually might try to do a few different short episodes this weekend. And so I'll try not to read some of the superfluous stuff. You know, if you guys want to read this article in its entirety, you can. It's uh, Once again, it's from Scientific American. So let me scroll by the crap that's not really pertinent to what I want to uh, discuss here. But actually, right off the bat, this first question and answer is uh, pretty interesting. You've written and spoken eloquently about nature of reality. Should that be the nature of reality and consciousness, the genesis of life, the possibility of life beyond Earth, the origin and fate of the universe, and more? How do all those disparate topics synergize into one cohesive message for you? To me, science is one way of connecting with the mystery of existence. And if you think of it that way, the mystery of existence is something that we have wondered about ever since people began asking questions about who we are and where we come from. I'm talking about science as part of a much grander and older sort of question about who we are in the big picture of the universe. To me, as a theoretical physicist, 
not me, but Glazer or Glazer, and, uh, and also someone who spends time out in the mountains, this sort of questioning offers a deeply spiritual connection with the world through my mind and through my body. Einstein would have said the same thing, I think, with his cosmic religious feeling. And so I should say uh, right up front, I'm going to agree with this guy in in some ways. I'm also going to disagree with him. And right when I, right when he brings up kind of nature, you know, the mystery of existence and this, the way he phrases it, the cosmic religious feeling, I was thinking, wow, this is right up my alley, man. Okay. And um, I'm going to click on this link here. And I, I followed this link the other day. It, it goes to uh, Wikipedia and it discusses uh, Einstein and cosmic spirituality. So it says, in 1930, Einstein published a widely discussed essay in the New York Times Magazine about his beliefs with the title Religion and Science. Einstein distinguished three human impulses which develop religious belief. Fear, social or moral concerns, and a cosmic religious feeling. A primitive understanding of causality causes fear, and the fearful invent supernatural beings analogous to themselves. The desire for love and support create a social and moral need for a supreme being. Both these styles have an anthropomorphic concept of God. The third style, which Einstein deemed most mature, originates in a deep sense of awe and mystery. He said the individual feels the sublimity and marvelous order which reveal themselves in nature. And he wants to experience the universe as a single significant whole. Einstein saw science as an antagonist of the first two styles of religious belief, but as a partner in the third. He maintained, even though the realms of religion and science in themselves are clearly marked off from each other, there are strong reciprocal relationships and dependencies. As aspirations for truth derive from the religious fear, he... Okay. Oh, and this is an interesting quote. A person who is religiously enlightened appears to me to be one who has, to the best of his ability, liberated himself from the fetters of his selfish desires and is preoccupied with thoughts, feelings, and aspirations to which he clings because of their superpersonal value. It seems to me that what is important is the force of this superpersonal content, regardless of whether any attempt is made to unite this content with a divine being. For otherwise, it would not be possible to count Buddha and Spinoza as religious personalities. Accordingly, a religious person is devout in the sense that he has no doubt of the significance of those superpersonal objects and goals which neither require nor are capable of rational foundation. In this sense, religion is the age-old endeavor of mankind to become clearly and completely conscious of these values and goals and constantly to strengthen and extend their effect. If one conceives of religion and science according to these definitions, then a conflict between them appears impossible, for science can only ascertain what is, but not what should be. And so, yeah, this stuff really is right up my alley, and uh, I've never read that Einstein quote before. But uh, we've probably all heard mention of, uh, you know, the God of Einstein and Spinoza um, in this kind of ongoing battle between theists and atheists. Often um, people try to make a distinction between, you know, the fundamental religious or fundamentalist religious take on God. Um, not always, but sometimes an almost childish kind of anthropomorphic uh view of of, of a, a deity as opposed to the so-called god of spinoza and einstein this more kind of vague impersonal take on god uh god is kind of you know like the ground of all being nature as god um the totality of the universe um kind of a a pantheistic take. And so Einstein is comparing that kind of view of quote unquote God as being the most mature and juxtaposes it with these kind of less mature concepts of God or religious beliefs born of fear or superstition, you know, um, kind of contrasting it with that. And if you're a regular listener, 
you've probably heard me speak ad nauseum about how I do think that we do seem wired to kind of hunger for the transcendent to um, seek these experiences where we do find it kind of feel plugged into something bigger than ourselves as hippy dippy as it might sound where we feel at what like we're one with the universe where we, you know the kind of ego melts into the the totality of everything um or, or gives way to the totality of everything you know and i've often said how i think these are very rich and important experiences and i couldn't imagine life without these kind of experiences you know these kind of quote-unquote transcendent experiences where uh they could be triggered by art or music the beauty of nature uh love making drug taking whatever <laughs> you know what i mean there's all sorts of doors to get to these different transcendent states of consciousness and so as much as I appreciate and value these experiences, you've probably heard me say this before, that my big caveat or uh, reservation is, all right, we know these experiences are real and we know they're profound. Uh, we know how important they are um, to the experience of being human. But just because it feels like we're in the presence of the divine or we're one with the universe, that doesn't nece necessarily mean that's what's going on. I can't say with 100% certainty that that's not what's going on, but because of the obvious relationship between chemistry and consciousness, um, it could also, it seems to me, it's logical to assume these could just be chemically induced states. Um, you know, whether we're talking about psilocybin mushrooms, lysergic acid, meditation, um, the chemical reactions in the brain during sex or orgasm or the runner's high or, uh, you know, the changes in consciousness after a few drinks or a strong cup of coffee, uh, you know, um, we know that there's a direct correlation between chemistry and consciousness. And it could be that could very and this is as fascinated as I am with spirituality I do think you know it's uh, sadly it's probably most likely the case that consciousness is an emergent property of the brain I don't know that 100% agnostic atheist by lean towards that side you know and it could just be that these quote unquote spiritual or transcendent experiences are also products of the meat brain you know what i mean that doesn't mean that they don't have value and and they can't be profoundly transformative but i think that is a real possibility we should take into consideration but i am sympathetic to his view of you know uh valuing this kind of cosmic religious feeling he says or, or the uh, interviewer says, so which aspect of your work do you think is most relevant to the Templeton Foundation spiritual aims? Probably my belief in humility. I believe we should take a much humbler approach to knowledge in the sense that if you look carefully at the way science works, you'll see that, yes, it is wonderful, magnificent, but it has limits. And we have to understand and respect those limits. And by doing that, by understanding how science advances, science really becomes a deeply spiritual conversation with the mysterious about all the things we don't know. So that's one answer to your question. And that has nothing to do with organized religion. Obviously, but it does inform my position against atheism. I consider myself an agnostic. And so I think we're going to get into this soon. But where I begin to see differently is on his take with atheism, which I think when responding to uh, Crocoduck, I think I told him that, yeah, I, I was kind of simpatico with uh, his appreciation of the quote unquote God of Spinoza or Einstein, but that I thought his take on 
atheism was maybe a, a bit too rigid or almost a caricature. And as I used to speak of, about a lot in the early days of the podcast, I think there is that overlap between atheism and agnosticism. And atheism doesn't necessarily mean, or being an atheist doesn't necessarily mean that you claim to know with 100% certainty that there is no God. I think that overlap can be kind of confusing. And there are uh, a, a lot of, I think even like Daniel Dennett, there are a, a lot of kind of staunch atheists who will uh, imply that even if they don't know it, even, you know, most agnostics are technically atheists. Uh, and Daniel Dennett had that bit, which I actually I found kind of amusing, where I think it was a take on... Is it Jeff Foxworthy? Is that the guy who had the bit about you may, you might be a redneck if Dennett had this bit, you might be an atheist if, and he kind of rattles off all these things that um, might make a lot of people technically atheists, even if they don't think of themselves as atheists, even if they think of themselves as being merely agnostic. And I consider myself to be uh, an agnostic atheist, and... That might sound contradictory to a lot of people, and uh, it gets kind of tiring trying to explain it. But it means you're agnostic because you don't th you think that factually we don't know or, or or can't know whether or not empirically there is or isn't a god, etc. Um, so we're agnostic in that sense, but. We're atheistic in the sense that we do doubt the existence of a god because of what we see as a dearth or lack of compelling evidence. And so already I'm kind of viewing his view on atheism as being kind of less than charitable. It makes me wonder if he's had any discussions with some of the more staunch atheists out there like Richard Dawkins because I think in a way, Richard Dawkins and this guy would actually be on the same page when it comes to, well, I think they would both agree as being the kind of beauty and wonder of viewing the universe through a scientific lens and kind of standing in awe at the mystery of it all. I mean, any of us who have any kind of real appreciation for Dawkins have probably heard him kind of wax poetic along these lines. And I, I think a, a point that Richard Dawkins makes repeatedly, uh, and I'm really paraphrasing here, is that you don't need religion to have this almost transcendent appreciation of the cosmos and its mystery, you know? And, and that's kind of the beauty of science, is that you don't claim... To have all the answers, it's the excitement of the hunt for the answers and uh, the excitement of, of making discoveries and, and uh, accumulating information and putting the puzzle pieces together, at least trying, you know? And so it continues, uh, and, and this is Gleiser or Glazer talking. I honestly think atheism is inconsistent with the scientific method. What I mean by that is, what is atheism? It's a statement, a categorical statement that expresses belief in non-belief. And right there, that's, our, that's kind of a, a problematic definition of atheism to me, a belief in non-belief. I would more say it's the absence of belief. Uh yeah, belief and non-belief seems seems a little uncharitable to me. Um, I don't believe, even though I have no evidence for or against. Simply, I don't believe. And so that really, that almost strikes me as something more you'd expect, like a uh, a Bible thumper to say, not a theoretical physicist who you'd expect to at least have some kind of lay understanding of uh, the philosophical definitions of atheist and agnostic and have some appreciation of the kind of possible overlap or whatever. 
I don't believe even though I have no evidence for or against. I si simply, I don't believe. And that's kind of what I meant by a, a caricature of atheism or atheists. It kind of sounds like, you know, he's describing the stereotypical caricature of the atheist who looks down their nose at religion and doesn't believe because they don't want to believe. They're, they're too good for that kind of thing, you know? When, uh, and another thing I've discussed on the show ad nauseum is how I personally came to become a non-believer and how it was a very kind of painful and harrowing journey. And it was kind of like my reason eroded my faith. And so I think, you know, he talks about, even though I have no evidence for or against, I sim simply, I don't believe. And to me, it's kind of the lack of evidence for the claims of religion that makes a lot of people atheists. You know what I mean? It's uh, the lack of compelling evidence for the existence of specific concepts of gods or for the validity of specific religious claims. I think, you know, Victor Stenger said something about, yeah, if you're going to talk about the god of Spinoza or the, the god of the deists, then, yeah, it's hard to, dis it's hard to disprove that, you know? Um, and, and he, he would talk about how his own personal atheism kind of, the pendulum, the pendulum swings harder when you get into the specific claims of specific religions. And I, I, that's how I see it too. And if we're just talking about the vague notion of some higher power, yeah, it's hard to disprove that. And you, you maybe, you know, you do need to approach that with more due humility. But if you're talking about the... Judeo-Christian God or specific concept of God, then yeah, I think it's it's fair to say, you know, there's a lack of evidence for that. So my atheism swings harder in, in that specific regard. And this is going to be another one of those uh, episodes where you can hear my chihuahua snoring in the background. It's after 10 at night. I keep my computer in the bedroom and she, uh, pushes open the door right after sometime around 10 and uh, insists on being lifted up into the bed where she then uh, snores all night. Yeah, and he continues, I don't believe even though I have no evidence for or against, simply I don't believe, period. It's a declaration. But in science, we don't really do declarations. So I think, you know, once again, I think that's a caricature of how the average atheist actually views things. I think yeah, there probably are some people out there who embrace a kind of more militant or hard atheism. Almost the type of people you see uh, caricatured in uh, these kind of fundy pure flicks movies like uh, God's Not Dead, etc. <laughs> you know, the miserable college professor who claims to know beyond doubt that there is no God or something. But I think most atheists, once again, even um, high-profile staunch atheists like uh, Sam Harris or Richard Dawkins, they don't claim to know with 100% certainty that there is no God. They're just not convinced that there is a God, um, specifically when you're talking about specific concepts of God, like the Judeo-Christian concept of God, we say, okay, you can have a hypothesis. You have to have some evidence against or for that. And so an agnostic would say, look, I have no evidence for God or any kind of God. What God, first of all? The Maori gods or the Jewish or Christian or Muslim God? Which God is that? But on the other hand, an agnostic would acknowledge no right to make a final statement about something he or she doesn't know about. The absence of evidence is not evidence of absence and all that. This positions me very much against all the quote-unquote new atheist guys, even though I want my message to be respectful of people's beliefs and reasoning, which might be community-based or dignity-based and so on. And I think obviously the Templeton Foundation likes all of this because this is part of an emerging conversation. It's not just me, it's also my colleague, the astrophysicist Adam Frank, and a bunch of others talking more and more about the relation between science and spirituality. And yet, so in a way, I mean, he kind of sounds like he himself 
well, he, well, he identifies as an agnostic, but may even be an agnostic atheist. Um, and so he seems like he may even be kind of naively unaware. Even, and I'm trying to keep things in perspective here and approach this with my own due measure of humility because I'm not in a, a, a prize winning theoretical physicist. I'm a complete lay person here who just has an interest in this stuff, but he seems unaware of that overlap between atheism and agnosticism and how, you know, there's different degrees of atheism. There's soft atheism, there's hard atheism. Um, and he talks about, you know, this kind of famous quote, the absence of evidence is not the is not evidence of absence. And I think that's true in regard to the idea of a higher power in general. Just because, and once again, personally agnostic atheist, I think uh, as far as a knowledge claim goes, you know, uh, I don't think we can know definitively whether there is or isn't a higher power. And so I think that Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. I think that holds true for some vague idea, some deistic or pantheistic idea of, of a god or a higher power. But I don't think that's necessarily true for specific man-made concepts or claims of God. You know, I can't prove with uh, 100% certainty that the God of the Bible doesn't exist, you know, but... The things that caused me to lose the faith I was brought up in, you know, I, I was raised a Roman Catholic and, you know, the stuff that gives me pause or that causes me to doubt is the kind of grossly apparent man-made nature of religion. Um, the obvious man-made nature of religious texts, you know, and, and the way that religions externally contradict one another and internally often even contradict themselves. If you think about, you know, the man-made nature of the Bible, the way the Bible uh, often contradicts itself. Um, I mean, they're called the synoptic gospels for a reason. You, you have three synoptic from the Greek meaning to, to see alike or something like that. So yet you, you have three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that uh, agree on a lot of stuff, um, but there's even some differences in there. And then you have John, which is significantly different, where you have Jesus actually technically dying on a different day in the Gospel of John than in the Synoptics, most likely as a kind of literary device to, to try to um, portray Christ as the Paschal Lamb, the Lamb who dies for the sins of the world. Then you have the doublets in the Old Testament and all that kind of stuff. You know, we can see how monotheism grew out of polytheism, how the Judaism of the Old Testament borrows from neighboring pagan traditions. Um, and it itself, as a tradition, probably grew out of, you know, Mesopotamian polytheism. So right away, you know, the man-made nature of religion makes me doubt the veracity or validity of the concepts of God or the supernatural claims contained in any religion, you know? But yeah, I do try to retain some humility and, admit, you know, I'm one little creature, one uh, shaved primate on one rock in an infinite universe or, you know, infinitely expanding universe, if that's correct. And it would be extreme hubris for me to claim I knew with 100% certainty whether or not there's a higher power or that I know the answers to all the cosmic mysteries, you know, um, all the mysteries of the universe. But using my logic and reason and trying to look at things with open eyes, I, I think it's safe to assume that uh, that is obviously man-made as all the Earth's religions are, that, um, you know, it's probably safe to assume none of them have a monopoly on the truth. So I guess I'll call it quits. As always, thanks for listening, everyone. Um, you guys know the drill. You can like the Facebook page. You can follow uh, the show on Twitter. Not too much exciting happens on Twitter. I know I'm not as active on Twitter as a lot of other content creators. For the most part, I, I just kind of 
like and retweet other people's stuff and uh i'll tweet out links to uh new episodes etc um you can check out the youtube channel maybe you're doing that now uh if you want to help the show out monetarily you can go to patreon.com slash the week in doubt and help the show out for as little as 99 cents a month or you can contribute via paypal Uh, you can find the uh, paypal link at the bottom of the podbean page Uh, There's all that alliteration. All right, brothers and sisters, until next time.